I am a critic of capitalism. I think the system is over. And that's very hard. It's hard for me, it's hard for you. I understand that. I tell you the story because I want you to understand that that kind of political approach not only can win, it has won. I don't know what's going to happen in Greece. No one else does either. The greatest struggle now, and I can see from your faces that I should spend another two, three minutes before I go into what I plan to say, to tell you about it, because you're interested, and that's very good. In economics, I'm a professor of economics. This is what all the textbooks teach. The burden of responsibility and a loan is on the creditor. It is the job of the creditor to assess the riskiness of the borrower, the capacity of the borrower to repay, the condi conditions that apply and that may make it more or less difficult. A lender is not supposed to lend to somebody unless they have made clear by their own due diligence, it's called, that the borrower is capable. And when the debt can't be paid back, it's prima facie evidence that the work of the creditor was faulty. Therefore, you punish the creditor as well as the debtor. In Europe, the game is being played that somehow paying back the entire debt is entirely on the borrower. They keep saying that because they're counting on the people of the world not to know what I've just told you, which is that's not the way this is handled. But it's worse. One quarter of the people are unemployed. One out of four Greeks are unemployed, which means every single Greek family has somebody, because Greek families are large, that's unemployed, often many. The Greek minimum wage, which was lousy to begin with, has been reduced. Greek public employees, which is the largest group of employees, their public sector is larger than the private sector in Greece, have suffered a 40% cut in salary, 40% from 2010. But not to look in the face of that reality and not to begin to think what it means, that would be silly. And because other people are afraid to think it or say it is precisely why it's important that I do that and that you just think about what it is I have to say. Hello good people, welcome to our YouTube channel. Now, this is Richard D. Wolf. Richard D. Wolf is an American-Mexican economist. He is well known for his uh, contributions to the field of economic methodology and class analysis. He is a professor of economic emeritus at the University of uh, Massachusetts and currently serves as a visiting professor in a graduate program. Wolf frequently discusses issues related to America economy and uh, global geopolitical dynamics. <clears throat> Together with, the, with the Dr. Richard Wolf, in this video we are going to discuss some of the economic hardships that is loading in America and that black people should stand together as a family to overcome them. Let's dive together, watch this uh, video by Richard Wolf. then at the end of the video I think we're gonna meet and discuss more as far as this topic is concerned. Let's dive in. So here's some indexes. I never did a radio program in my life before March of 2011. In March of 2011, WBAI, a Pacifica station in New York City, asked me, since I live in New York City, to do a radio program about the economic crisis. Uh, so I began a weekly program trying to explain what was going on from a critical perspective, which is the same perspective I've had pretty much um, most of my adult life, but which until recently was something I couldn't speak about very easily in most auditoriums or most settings because my audience within a few minutes would become very uncomfortable, <laughs> uh, feeling as though I were doing something that might cause somebody to bite them or to take down their names or somehow make life difficult. And I could feel that. I've been a teacher all my life. You can feel it when your students are not happy with what they're getting. Uh, but I did the best I could. Uh, and then I did this radio program trying to explain it. 
And here I am, um, not even four years later, and the program is now on 42 stations across the United States, including Houston, Tampa, Denver, New York, Moscow, Idaho, <laughs> Peoria, Illinois, Vancouver, and we just got this week Brighton in England. So uh, something is going on that you should be thinking about that that would have happened and I never spent one minute or one dime to make that happen. They all came to me because they want this kind of critical programming for their stations. Something is going on. About this trip, I speak here tonight. I just came on the airplane this afternoon. Uh, New York City, when I left it, was covered with ice at 22 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm a little, my body is still reacting to the warmth here. Uh, so I speak here tonight. Tomorrow I speak at the Musicians Union Hall on Vine Street uh, as a benefit for KPFK. The following night I do another benefit, but this one in Delhi Hall in Santa Ana. I leave Friday for the Bay Area where I do three more talks. Two in Berkeley, one for KPFA, the station up there in the First Congregational Church of Berkeley, which is the largest auditorium the city has, where I've done this before. And then I end up in the Sonoma Community Center speaking to the folks in the wine country who have brought me up there. In each and every case, they brought me. I didn't solicit it. I didn't look for it. It is something that audiences want to hear. Okay. I do this twice a month, east, west, north, and south. If I had more time and didn't have 50 other things to do, I'd probably be traveling perpetually. I turn down three invitations for every one that I accept. I now bunch them together like the ones I'm doing here in California because otherwise I couldn't see as many audiences in the trips as when I can bunch them together. So I am, for example, going up into Maine to do two or three universities there, Vermont, the, the Boston area, uh, Denver, Minnesota. I can't keep them all straight. I now am an enterprise. You are not looking at a person. You're looking at an enterprise. It's called a 501c3, which means we are tax exempt under a government law. It's called Democracy at Work, the name of our organization. I have one full-time and five part-time people that work with me, and that's just because there's no other way to get a radio program. I'm on television in New York City now also. We're moving into more and more television. It's enormous, and it's all fed by an enormous explosion of interest in this kind of analysis. And this is important, please, to understand, because you, like me, come out of a country that for 50 years of the Cold War and after was afraid to think or talk about these things in the way that I do. And now we can. For those 50 years, we had every right to say it was impossible. The media were against us, the government was against us, the people were afraid, and it was very hard for us to make headway. That's not the case anymore. And the irony is, if the left in the United States doesn't make enormous breakthroughs in the next period, it's on us because we can now. I am the proof of that, and that's why I tell you about it. I am finding in every corner of the country, I'm going to Tampa. <laughs> I don't mean to be critical of the folks in Tampa, but I'm going to Tampa because the radio station down there, which carries my program, WMNF now thinks it can fill an auditorium with the people who want to hear this. And to make no mistake and to make it really clear, I am a critic of capitalism. I think the system is over. And that's very hard. It's hard for me, it's hard for you. I understand that. But not to look in the face of that reality and not to begin to think what it means, that would be silly. 
and because other people are afraid to think it or say it, is precisely why it's important that I do that and that you just think about what it is I have to say. Last introduction. Two weeks ago, in a small country, savaged by what we call austerity, country of Greece, something extraordinary happened. And I want to briefly make sure you all know what it was, because it's all about what is going to happen in the United States, too. May not come out the same way, but something like that is going on. It's already very advanced in the country of Spain, which is the likely next place where this is going to happen. But it's happening everywhere. What happened? Very important. For most of the last 30 or 40 years, Greece was governed by two political parties remarkably like the Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> However, they had different names, because it's Europe. So the Republican Party there is called New Democracy. And the Democratic Party is called the Greek Socialist Party. That's just different European words for a similar reality. And they did the two-step shuffle. A few years, one party was the prime minister, and then a few years, the other party was, and then they handed it back. Very gentlemanly, very nice, very friendly, no trouble. A little bit like Republicans and Democrats, with a little theatrical name calling to spice it up, but nothing really important. And after the name calling, everybody goes out and has a drink. And so the Greeks did it too. The two parties together got two-thirds to three-quarters of the vote. Every election, the two parties got that proportion. They didn't get 100% because the Greeks, like most Europeans, have multiple political parties. They actually believe, <laughs> backward people that they are, that one ought to have political choice. They want the freedom of choice of a lot of different parties to choose among. We here in America, of course, we know better, two's enough. <laughs> When we go to the supermarket, we want 47 brands of soup. We want a lot of choice in soup. But in political parties, two's enough. Two's enough. But who needs it? By the Europeans being backward folks, they like a lot of parties. The Greeks always had a lot of parties. What happened two weeks ago is stunning. The two parties that used to be in charge together got a quarter of the vote. The middle of Greek politics, the consensus for normality that had become the law, vanished. The Greek Socialist Party is not barely there. It shot itself in the foot. Greek socialism is set back for decades because they administered austerity like everybody else. And who took their place? The extremes, a right-wing party called Golden Dawn in that country, and a left-wing party called Syriza. But what is very interesting is that the vast bulk of the people in the middle who'd had it with their Republican and Democrats went to the left. And they voted in Syriza. Syriza got close to half the vote. In a country like Greece, that's a mandate. One party never gets that many votes. This isn't just a defeat of the middle. It's a mandate sweep victory for the left. The left. Over the years, I've worked occasionally with a number of European economists. And one of the ones I worked with on occasion, and even brought to meetings like this with me in New York, was a young Greek professor named Yanis Varoufakis. He's now the finance minister. That really is a little bit like Greece doing what would here mean I'd be the finance minister. <laughs> and you can imagine how much will have changed were that to be the case. Yanis Varoufakis is the finance minister. Syriza is in power. Alex Tsipras is the new leader of this country, uh, prime minister. This is a party 
many of whose people like best the following slogan, Greece can do better than capitalism. Wow. We're not talking about a little fringe. Five years ago, Syriza got 4% of the vote. We're talking about a left-wing coalition. The word Syriza is a coalition. A coalition of left-wing social movements and political groups. That's what it is. That means, if I may be so bold, that institutions in Greece, not that different, say, from the ACLU, got together with other groups like that, made a political party, and said, we're going to go to the mass of people and say, if you've had it with austerity, vote for us. And an overwhelming population said, will do and did. Commitments of Syriza raise the minimum wage by a lot. Restore the pensions that were taken away from the Greek people over the last four years. Stop selling assets of the government into privatization. This will make sure, for those of you that are concerned, that the next time you visit the Parthenon, you will still not be able to get any McDonald's there. <laughs> which, if you've ever seen the Parthenon, is, is a good, good thing, by and large. I tell you the story because I want you to understand that that kind of political approach not only can win, it has won. I don't know what's going to happen in Greece. No one else does either. The greatest struggle now, and I can see from your faces that I should spend another two, three minutes before I go into what I plan to say, to tell you about it because you're interested, and that's very good. The first problem Mr. Varoufakis, the new finance minister, has is to get out from under the enormous debts that Greeks has to the European country, the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. Why does Greece owe that much money to them? Because over the last four years, you read in American newspapers that Greece was bailed out. No, that's not what happened. These European institutions that are representative of the Europe as a whole lent $300 billion to Greece. That's true. But what did they lend the money for? So that Greece could pay back the private banks in France, Germany, Britain, and the United States to whom they were indebted. Greeks didn't get bailed out. French. German, British, and American banks got gailed out. They got back everything rather than what they would have had to do is come to a deal with Greece. What kind of a deal? The same deal that has to be worked out every time a debtor can't pay his or her bills. Every court in the United States now has those cases in front of it. Every court everywhere does because people who borrow find themselves unable to pay back all the time. And the courts come in and they make a deal. They work it out. And part of the pain of the adjustment is in the borrower's camp. He can't pay back. And part of it is in the lender's camp. Why? Because in economics, I'm a professor of economics, this is what all the textbooks teach. The burden of responsibility in a loan is on the creditor. It is the job of the creditor to assess the riskiness of the borrower, the capacity of the borrower to repay, the condi conditions that apply and that may make it more or less difficult. A lender is not supposed to lend to somebody unless they have made clear by their own due diligence, it's called, that the borrower is capable. And when the debt can't be paid back, it's prima facie evidence that the work of the creditor was faulty. Therefore, you punish the creditor as well as the debtor. In Europe, the game is being played that somehow paying back the entire debt is entirely on the borrower. They keep saying that because they're counting on the people of the world not to know what I've just told you, which is that's not the way this is handled. But it's worse. They want the Greeks to pay, even though the Greeks say, we can't. 
If we have to pay it back, we will have to continue damaging the economy of Greece. And to give you an idea, one quarter of the people are unemployed. That's what it was in 1933 at the worst moment of the U.S. Depression. One quarter of the people are unemployed. One out of four Greeks are unemployed, which means every single Greek family has somebody, because Greek families are large, that's unemployed, often many. The Greek minimum wage, which was lousy to begin with, has been reduced. Greek public employees, which is the largest group of employees, the public sector is larger than the private sector in Greece, have suffered a 40% cut in salary, 40% from 2010. Their pensions have been cut, their medical, they had a national medical insurance, like all European countries, has been savaged. It is a country that has really been whacked around on a scale that we don't not yet know. Notice, please, the word yet. This will only get worse if we have to pay the debts. Because how does a country like Greece pay all these debts? By using money that used to pay public employees who produce public services for people, but now you have to use that money not to hire those people and not to produce those services, but to pay off whom? Basically, you've already paid off the private banks. Now you're going to repay the governments and the governmental institutions that saved those private banks. And the Syriza people say, we're not going to do that. We are not going to do it. Not us, not ever. And the Germans, because they are taking the commanding role in Europe, they are now the most powerful country. They are the leader of Europe, something they never had before, because before it was only a dream in the minds of people like uh, Adolf Hitler. <laughs> who tried to do it with military weapons and couldn't. But he didn't need to. Capitalism would do it for him. And so the Germans, led by Angela Merkel, have said the Greeks must pay. They must adhere to their obligations. Last point for this, so you get the irony of it. In 1953, it's so important to know your history. It's so dangerous if you don't. In 1953, Germany was reeling under its debts. Debts it had incurred because of World War I and World War II. Germany had the very bad taste of starting those two wars. That would have been okay, but also losing them. <laughs> this was not okay. And in the great wisdom of people at that time, whoever lost the war was required to make payments. So the Germans owned a, owed a ton of money. And in 1953, they went to their creditors, France, Britain, and the United States, both the banks and the governments, and said, look, we can't rebuild from the war. That would not have been an argument that would have made much sense to your former enemy. But they had a good argument. You want us to be a good ally against the Soviet Union? You want us to be a good part of the Cold War? We have to be able to rebuild. And this debt is killing us. So they met in London to discuss it. They started in February of 1953. And they met all through the summer. And in August of 1953, they agreed to the following deal. It's called the London Agreement. Look it up. Nowadays with Google, it all takes 12 seconds. <laughs> I am not paid by Google. I didn't uh, say that for that reason. In August of 1953, here was the deal. The United States, France, and Britain, ready? Forgave Germany 50% of its debt written off. And the other 50% was stretched out to become a 30-year loan, meaning the amount of money Germany would have to come up with each year was reduced to next to nothing. The Germans demanded, begged, and got what they now want to deny Greece. The only word for that is disgusting. But you will not hear this story in the American press, or very rarely. European press is full of it, but not here. A big struggle is being waged. And here's the double irony. If the Europeans insist that the Greeks pay, the Greeks will have two 
steps, and only two. They cannot cave in. The American press writes as though, well, they may cave in. I mean, they may, but it will be self-destruction. If they cave in, they will destroy themselves just like the Greek Socialist Party before them, which voted, got voted in to be anti-austerity and then ended up administering austerity and is now dead. Another country where exactly the same thing happened, France. Over the last two years in France, the Socialist Party won the presidency, kicked out Sarkozy, brought in Hollande. They won the, the French Senate. The Socialists haven't controlled the Senate for 50 years. They have the President, they have the Senate, and they have the National Assembly. The Socialists controlled everything on a campaign of anti-austerity. They got in and they administered austerity. And now Mr. Hollande gets the lowest uh, popularity rating. He's looking up at the rating of George Bush. <laughs> That's low. That is really low. He's finished, and probably the Socialist Party of France will take decades to come back if it ever does. So Syriza knows this. They can't do that. That is literally self-destruction. So what are they going to do? They're going to say, we can't pay, and we won't pay. The Europeans, if they're going to not bluff, are going to then say, OK, we're not giving you another nickel. Well, the, the Greek government can't function if they don't get anything because they have no way to do that. Or do they? They do. There's only one way left. If you want to stick to your guns and you can't get help from Europe, then the only way to get the wherewithal to take care of the mass of the Greek people is to take it away from the Greek elite to take it from the rich and give it to everybody else. The nightmare of modern capitalist society is being brought by the mechanisms of capitalism itself. It's giving these folks no choice. And if you see an agreement over the next few weeks between the Europeans and Syriza, it's because they figured it out, that they are better off giving Syriza writing off those debts than trying to push in any other way because that's even scarier than writing off the debts because if the Greeks could pull off removing the wealth from the rich to help everybody else, what awful thoughts could enter the minds of people everywhere else, ah, even in the United States. What an interesting solution. OK, now let's turn to the United States. We did something like it. Mr. Tsipras likes to say that Syriza is just doing what FDR did. So I want to begin by, again, reminding you about a little history. This time it's our history, FDR. It's 1933. We've got a collapse of capitalism. Worse even than the one we've had since 2008. It's really bad. 25% of our people are unemployed. Poverty is everywhere. You know, many of you read, I don't know, uh, John Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath, Mice or Men. Remember those descriptions? Uh, well, a lot of people were like that. A lot of people waited for the coal car to come by on the freight train because little bits of coal would fall off and the children would go and get them because they're the only way you keep warm. Etc., 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 etc. Much good American literature was produced out of that misery. But something interesting happened. Again, Greece is an interesting example. The American people reacted to that misery, the collapse from the roaring 20s into the miserable 30s, by getting angry at rich people and at corporations, big time. Starting in 1933, millions of Americans who had never been in a union, who came from families when no one had ever been in a union, joined unions. It was the greatest organizing drive in American history. Unions have never achieved that before, and they've never achieved anything like it since. 
in a matter of two or three years, millions of Americans joined a union to save them from the horrors of the Depression. Working together with the unions, organizing, were two socialist parties, not just one, two. A kind of reformist, middle of the road one, and a, what we now call Trotskyite one. The Socialist Party and the Socialist Workers Party, for those of you who know your history. And also working with them was the American Communist Party. Big, powerful organizations, all of them. And the combination, wow, the Communists, the Socialists, and the CIO, it was called, the Movement to Organize Workers. That's where the AFL-CIO comes from, the CIO part. And they mobilized millions of Americans. And they went and talked with Roosevelt, and they had a conversation. Frank, they said, <laughs> we here represent millions and millions of people. Uh, we like you. You're a Democrat. And compared to Republicans, we probably like any Democrat. But nonetheless, we like you. We like you. And uh, we want to support you. But you've got to do something about the mass suffering of the American people. And we got to tell you in all honesty that if you don't, we got a lot of people who want to do here what those Russians did over in the Soviet Union. And this is 1933. The, the Soviet Revolution is a memory. It wasn't that long before that. And Roosevelt was a very smart politician. He knew they were not bluffing. They represented millions of people. They had mobile. They had done something that nobody expected them to do. Organize all these industries. Go back if you have a chance to go to a library and look at the, the cities across America that were scenes of worker demonstrations every day. Minneapolis and Philadelphia and Chicago and New York and Trenton and on and on and on. This was scary time for business. So Roosevelt listened and he said, OK, I'm going to make you a deal. I'm going to go talk to the rich and the corporate leaders. Roosevelt knew them since he had gone to school with them, intermarried with them, and all the rest. So these were friends of his. And I'll see what I can do. And he met with the businesses. And he said to the businesses, basically, uh, I've got to take care of all these poor people. Uh, and I advise you to help me. Because the only way I can take care of them is if you give me the money. <coughs> Because it's a depression. We don't have any money. Nobody's paying taxes. Everybody's unemployed. All the businesses are shut down. The government has no money, like today. So we have no money. The only way I can take care of the people is if you give me the money. And I advise you to do it. Because if you don't, those people are going to make sure you don't have any money to give me. <laughs> it's going to be over. Half of them were not convinced at all. That's the forerunner of what we call today the Koch brothers. No, no, serious. That's where that comes from. The other half agreed with Roosevelt. They were scared. With half of the business community and the rich in his pocket, he went back to the coalition of the CIO, the socialists, and the communists. And he said, OK, I got a deal. We can, we can do business. I am going to get money from the rich and the corporations, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to do it. But you've got to promise me something. Stop talking about revolution. Put that away. If you keep doing that, I can't make a deal. I can't get the rich and the... That's the deal. And they all agreed. The CIO bought it, the Socialists bought it, and the Communists bought it. They said they didn't, and not all of them agreed, but they bought it. And what did Roosevelt do? Now you can see why Mr. Tsipras and Syriza is paying attention. 1933, let's go real fast. Roosevelt gets up and says, I'm going to create Social Security. What? In the middle of a depression when there's no money, you're about to tell everybody who's over 65, here, here's a check every month for the rest of your life. Yep, that's what he did. And before he, people could even deal with the enormity, we had no social security before that, he announced the unemployment compensation system. We had never had a program of giving money to people who are out of work for a year or two every week. The government had no money. It was the Great Depression. He said, I'm going to give the old people who are over 65 a check every month, and the unemployed, of whom there were millions, a check every week. 
I'm going to raise the minimum wage, which he did. In fact, he established the minimum wage. We didn't have one before that. I'm going to make a minimum wage, and he made it nice and high. In real terms, higher than it is now. But then came the big one, as if these weren't big enough. I said the president, went on the radio, I am going to tell you, the American people, the following. If the private sector, he didn't use the word capitalist, that word sticks in Americans' throats. They can't <laughs> quite get it out, which is why I say it so often. So if the private sector can't provide work to the millions of Americans who ask only to have a job, then of course, as if it were self-evident, I, as president, have to do that. And between 1934 and 1941, he created and filled 15 million jobs in the United States, which the government paid for. They paid the salaries. Some of you visit the national parks. Many of those were built by those people, and so on. And where did he get the money? Because this is the best part. <laughs> he taxed corporations and the rich. I got to say it again. In an American audience, most of you will pretend you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> he taxed corporations and the rich a lot. That's where the money came from. Because that's where the money always is to solve these social problems. You know it, I know it, and unfortunately, they know it. But he did. Let me give you just a couple of examples. The top income tax bracket that Roosevelt was in favor of. Well, let's deal with the, the top he ever asked for. State of the Union message, 1944. We're in a war, in a war. He sends a message, Roosevelt president, to the Congress. I propose that the top bracket, the top income tax rate on the richest people be, ready, 100%. <laughs> See, you're laughing because you don't know your own history. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Every dollar over 25,000 a year, that was the cutoff then, that would be about 380, 390,000 a year now. Every dollar over 25,000 you get, and you don't get. <laughs> we get it, 100%. We take every dollar. The president proposed a maximum income. That's what that means. The maximum income you get is 25. And if you get more than that, you ain't getting it. He sent the message, the Republicans, doing what the Republicans are supposed to, went ballistic. <laughs> Yelling, screaming, blah, 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 until a compromise was reached between the Republicans and the Democrats, which they then sent to the president who signed it, making the top bracket in 1944, 94%. Every dollar over 25 you got, you got to keep six cents. And the other 94 cents went to the government of the United States. Republicans supported it, Democrats supported it. Even after Roosevelt died, for the next 20 years, the top bracket's within the 90%, 91, 92, and so on. Even in the 1970s, it was in the 70%. What is it today? 39%. That's a tax cut. That's a tax cut no working class person could imagine, let alone enjoy. We've taxed the rich. Here's another statistic for you. In 1945, end of the war, for every dollar in income tax that the federal government earned by taxing individuals, it got $1.50 in taxing corporations. So the total take from corporations was 50% more than the total take from individuals. Today, the same proportion for every dollar taxed in individuals, the corporations pay 25 cents. That's where it is. Oh, that's a tax cut. That is a wonderful tax cut. Uh, not for you, but for them. 
The last 50 years have been then what? Rolling back the tax on corporations and shifting it to individuals. And rolling back the tax on rich individuals and putting it instead on all of you. So on behalf of corporations and the rich, I want to say to all of you, thank you. <laughs> Very kind of you. Wonderful. All Syriza wants to do is play this game again, but with a different outcome. They want to go the other way. They want to tax the rich, of whom there are many. Not so long ago, a widowed wife of an American president married into one of those Greek families, didn't she? And that was not only because he was stunningly beautiful, he wasn't. <laughs> But as she once said to a reporter who asked her how could she marry such a person, he was so short, she said he looks much taller when he's standing on his money. <laughs> she was honest, if not, if not diplomatic. What happened over the last 30 years is really what I want to finish this up with. The United States shifted in the last 30 to 40 years radically away from everything Roosevelt did. It's as if the last 30 or 40 years could be described by the phrase, roll back the New Deal. Undo all that was done by, by this story of Roosevelt that I just told you. And we really know why. The business community hated this. They had to pay these enormous taxes to take care of what Mitt Romney called, you know, the 47% of moochers in our society. They were furious at these taxes. The rich were furious at paying 91%. Even if they got out of a lot of that with clever tax accountants, they still had to pay a lot to take care of, of I don't know, uh, you <laughs> or me. They didn't want that. They knew the problem wasn't Franklin Roosevelt. By 1945, the man was dead, so that clearly he wasn't the problem. But they knew it was never him. It was that coalition of unions and socialists. and co That was the problem. They knew that if you took away that political powerhouse, the ideas would never have come up. And you know, we know they're right because in the depression we've had since 2008, that coalition isn't there. And that's why Obama is not Roosevelt. There's nothing to make Obama be Roosevelt. And that's not an accident, and that's not a mystery. As soon as the war was over, the business community, the ones who had never been persuaded by Roosevelt, went to work to destroy that coalition. They began with the weakest link, the Communist Party. And they turned them from a militant organizing thing, which is what it had been in the 30s and 40s, into the horrible agent of a foreign power, and you know the rest. It's in all of our minds, whether we think it is or not, it's right there. It's in our culture. We demonized them. They were evil, bad. We killed a couple of them, didn't we? The Rosenbergs, for those of you who never heard these stories. We killed, we executed them. As agents, precisely, of Moscow. And as soon as the communists were wiped out, put in jail, deported, all the things we did to them, we did a very peculiar thing, although not surprising if you understand it. We went after the next weakest link, the socialists. And the way that we did it in this country was by saying, socialists are just like communists. They just spell it differently. <laughs> you know, I used to wonder, since I'm the child of immigrants, my mother was German, my father was French, and so, you know, if you grow up in a household with other languages, it's a different way of, of living. And I go back, because I have family in France, I go back and I spend a lot of time there, I speak those languages, and it took me a while to understand. If you go to Europe, France or Germany, you say communist and socialist, people know exactly, they're very different and they can explain to you what the difference is. Whereas here in America, my students, when I ask them, what's the relationship between communist Socialist, terrorist, Marxist, and anarchist. 
they all raise their hands and say, that's easy, synonyms. <laughs> well, and I used to think, are they dumb or they didn't learn anything? No, 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 there's nothing to do. That's what we were taught. A whole generation was taught. This is all the same. And today we, we know how to extend it. We add Muslim. But you know, why not? Makes as much sense as the other things being synonyms. It's kind of nutty. But it comes out of our culture. So you destroyed the socialists by saying they were, you know, more or less communists. And that left the labor movement. And if I had a piece of chalk, I'd show you what happened to the labor movement in the last 50 years. And it's a straight line down into the toilet. Today, the private sector, for those of you that do not know, in the private sector, which is the major part of our economy, the percentage of workers who are either members of a union or represented by a union is 6.7%. The other 93.3% of private sector workers are not represented by a union. So the next time you read a newspaper article that talks about our economy with big business over here and big labor, you're talking about someone who lives on another planet. <laughs> because that's make-believe. In their wildest dreams, the unions do not have that kind of power <coughs> and never did, but not now after a 50-year uninterrupted decline. Bottom line, the unions are small and weak. We don't have a socialist party or parties worth the name, and our communist party, if it vaguely exists, has no influence. The coalition that brought the success in the 30s is gone, destroyed, and not by accident or inadvertence, but by intent. And that's why in this collapse of capitalism, the second in 75 years, we don't have anything like that. We've just gone through seven years of really bad unemployment with no significant Republican or Democratic leader ever talking about public employment, which would be a way to solve the problem. What way? The way we used the last time. It's our history. It's like a collective amnesia. It's amazing. It's not that we debated it. Bro. It's as if it never happened. It never happened. And taxing corporations and the rich, this is like, I don't know, attacking motherhood and apple pie. It's unthinkable. But it's our history. And by the way, when you suggest it to people, I've done this in Washington, to congressmen and women, uh, the couple times they made the mistake of bringing me there. Uh, <laughs> and they said, we can't do that. That'll be the end of the poli our political careers. I loved explaining to them the one president in American history who really went after the rich and taxed them and really went after the corporations and taxed them was re-elected four times. <laughs> no other president in American history ever came close to that. He's the most popular president we ever had. Let's see. The most popular president was the one who taxed corporations and the rich to give everybody social security, unemployment, and a government job. Hello, Mr. Obama is going out of office not with such a great reputation. I think that's fair to say. He might have done better trying the other direction, following the example of Mr. Roosevelt. I mean, he can't run. By the way, you know why Obama can't run for a third term, because after Roosevelt died, the Republicans pushed through a law that no president can be more than twice, because they didn't want to have that happen again that another Democrat would get to four terms. That's our history. Wow. Why was it possible, having destroyed the left, destroyed its organizations, and not just destroyed the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, and wipe out the labor movement in large part, but along the way, when that was done, something very profound and psychological happened to the American left. And by that, I'm going to be, I'm going to take a chance and say, you. It happened to you. Into the American psyche settled an idea that to get together with other people to build a left 
alternative program and entity is a fundamentally dangerous thing to do and you probably shouldn't do it. You should probably go home and plant a garden or make some brownies or think about your family or focus on your career. All the things that are part of life but don't do that, there lies danger. For most of my adult life, when I start talking, people have a sense, oh, oh I know that. That's, uh, I, I need to cook something. <laughs> I have to get out of here because this is toxic. This, and you know, as all psychologists will tell you, the stuff we can't put into words is the stuff that has the greatest hold on us, the stuff we can't be conscious about. This is an unconscious lesson learned of inability to take that seriously. Americans are left-wingers in the sense of being critical as much as any country. That's what I, my career, that's why I opened this evening by telling you about what I'm doing. I'm doing that because the audience for that is here now. <coughs> and it's becoming more courageous with each passing week. It's wonderful. But it proves that you're here, we're here, we're strong, we're just afraid. Why do Europeans have general, you know, in this last five years, Italy, France, Greece, have had general strikes, demonstrations in the street, fighting against austerity, and now Syriza, and, and the, the, the Syriza, by the way, in, in Spain, if some of you are interested, is something called Podemos. And, and if follow in the press, when you see stories about Spain and Pod, Podemos in Spanish, if I'm not mistaken, is yes, we can, like Mr. Obama. So Podemos, follow it. Uh, there's a young man named Iglesias, who's their leader, uh, and, and it's extraordinary. Uh, how they are developing. Whereas Greece is a little country in a corner. Spain is the fourth largest economy in Europe. That's a whole new ball game. Greek, Greece owes $300 billion. Spain owes $2 trillion. So we're dealing with a whole nother cattle. Things are moving in Europe on a scale nobody foresaw. And part of the crazy language in Europe is because nobody knows how to react. This was not supposed to happen just like it's not supposed to happen here. And the same surprise may be underway. We are afraid. We don't have demonstrations, not because we don't have the view, and not because we don't have the people, but because we don't have the organizations. When something happens in Europe, phone call. My family's French. The minute something happens, my family, who are not political, middle of the road French people, they get a call from Henri, who lives across the street in Paris. <laughs> Has to be Henri or Pierre, whichever one you like. Henri or Pierre calls up and he explains to my family, thus and so and thus and so has happened. We need you in the street on Saturday at nine in the morning. And my family doesn't, doesn't ask for detail. It, just, it goes. It goes because Henri calls once or twice or three times a year and that's what he's there for. They know he's in whatever party he is. They trust him. They've known him since they were children together. And they've worked. That's called a network. That's an organization. The reason we're behind in this country is because we have to start from scratch. We have to build them anew. Because the ones we had were destroyed. The anti-communist frenzy after World War II in the United States never worked that well in Europe. Every European country has a communist party. The communist party is part of their public culture. If you sit in front of a television in France on a Sunday morning, you see, you know, like our Meet the Press, you see those television programs. One week they have the head of the Socialist Party, one week the head of the Conservative Party, one week the head of the Fascist Party, one week the head of the Communist Party. You see the Communist Party all the time. It's part of your political culture. In America, to see a person with a communist, you, you wear the horns. <laughs> Some of you saw me on the Bill Maher show this last July when he, he invited me to come and be the opening eight minute interview. For those of you who missed it, that's also an important sign, isn't it? That Bill Maher would ask someone like me and he wanted to talk, for those of you who saw it, about Marxism. And since he is a comic, 
I knew that part of my job was to say whatever I had to say in a humorous vein. So when he asked me, you know, is it true that you are a Marxist? I answered, looking him right in the face, yes. But look, I said, no horns. And the audience liked that. And that was important to change a little bit what might otherwise have developed out of that conversation. I've been on Bill Moyers, I've been on Charlie Rose, I've been on Up With Chris Hayes, I've been on them all. All within the last couple years. And all as a sign that this kind of conversation is no longer the taboo that it was for 50 years. Every society that has ever existed has produced among its people those who loved it and those who didn't. That's normal and that's healthy. If you wanted to understand, I know I've used this example before, but it works. If you wanted to understand the family that lives up the street from you, and you knew there was mother, father, and two kids, and you knew that one of the kids thought this was the best family, they were so lucky to be born in it, and the other one thought it was a dysfunctional mess. Would you, in order to understand the family, would you talk to one kid, either one? Or would you think that the reasonable thing to do is to talk to both children, and then you draw whatever conclusion these conversations lead you to? But you don't, you don't discuss only one. You talk, of, you want to hear the critical view. We've had critics of capitalism in our society all the time, but we wouldn't listen. We made them out to be disloyal, evil, scary, dangerous, threatening, all in the interest of not hearing that. That's not a very honorable way of proceeding. It's also self-defeating and dangerous. It gives you a lopsided view. One of the reasons the United States is open to what I am saying now in a way it never was in my lifetime before is that I'm in a sense providing something that has been the repressed content of the last 50 years. And I get a certain opening because a part of people, even people that are conservative, would like to kind of engage this conversation because somewhere they know they always should have. My wife's a psychotherapist. I get the reinforcement of this view because it conforms with her concept of human psychology. What happened in the last 30 years? The country went in the direction you would expect. The left opposition had been crushed. The organizations wiped out. And now the business community could come back with a vengeance and undo what had happened in the Great Depression. And boy, did they. From the 71% top income tax bracket on individuals in 1970, it's 39% now. Wow. Corporate profits are taxed at the lowest rate in many, many decades. Wonderful. Regulations removed. Privatization, sell everything. Instead of the post office, we can have FedEx. Wonderful. All of which was spoken that would liberate our economy. What? What? Again, the history. In the 1950s and 60s, the top income tax bracket was in the 90%. We had lower unemployment and faster economic growth than we have now. The story is not, we cut taxes on corporations and they really boosted, uh-uh. We cut taxes on corporation and we went in the toilet as an economy. Our growth is slow. 2014, our growth, averaged over the whole year, is 2.5%. Economic growth in the People's Republic of China, 7.5%. It's been that way for 20 years. That's why China is now the second economy in the world. They've been growing very f fast. They don't have free enterprise, poor folk. They don't have it. The government takes a heavy hand. And boy, does it pay off for them. I'm not arguing that we, we should be Chinese people or have their economy, but face the reality. We have run an economy in the interest of returning wealth to the rich and the corporations. Every statistic shows it. The top 
10%. I know these numbers sometimes get blurry, but they're not complicated. The top 10% of Americans own 90% of the wealth. The other 90% share the other 10%. Got it? It's exact inverse. 10% own 90% of the world, of the wealth in this country, and the other 90% of us share the other 10%. The United States used to like to make fun of certain countries, particularly in Latin America, as, quote, banana republics because of this lopsided distribution. We are a banana republic. We have arrived at that exalted state. We can't call other people that name anymore because it bounces right back on us. That's the reality. And what do those people who've taken all the wealth by undoing the liberal programs of the 1930s. What do they do? They're not stupid. They figured something out which is elemental and you have to have it in your mind just like they do. How do you get 10% of the people to own 90% of the wealth in a society that at least gives lip service to universal suffrage. Because then the 90% who don't have anything have the majority of the votes to control the government. And so sooner or later, they're going to figure out, gee, we should use our majority in the political realm to undo the inequality that a capitalist economic system has delivered to us. Now, my great people, after watching this video, I really want to know your thoughts in the comment section. And please talk to us and tell us, what do you think about this great video? You know, I normally tell people that uh, it's good to be self-dependent, to avoid depending on people because people will take advantage over you and therefore they will disappoint you. And this is where the black people, my African-American people should pick it from because this is where, this is the point we need to hit it hard. So I want us to discuss uh, areas where the system is working against the people. And when I say the people, I mean my people. How does this system work against uh, the people? What is the gap, the labor gap? What is this? And I think this is the point where my people should pick it from. We should hit it hard. Let, we're going to discuss the topic of uh, exploitation of workers. And uh, the, uh, Professor Rich, uh, Richard Wolf has touched on this. And I'm going to touch on it also in my research. And this is what I got. When looking at the exploitation of workers, we are looking at low wages. You know, when I mention the word low wages, uh, my black people understand what it means to uh, get the low wages. What does it mean? when someone tells you there is low wages and the, the system makes that easy to happen. Many labor systems pay workers wages that are insufficient to meet basic needs, especially in sectors like agriculture, retails, and manufacturing. And they also tend to work uh, long hours, extensive hours. Employers may demand long hours or mandatory over time, leading to physical and mental problems. And this is where, if you are a self-employed person, uh, you get it right. Because the, the long hours that you will be working for someone, uh, if you put it in your own job, you will be so productive and you'll produce massive outcome, massive produce. And this is where our people don't understand it. Okay? Lack of benefits. In many systems, workers do receive essential benefits like health care, paid leaves, or pensions, making them vulnerable to crisis. Number two, we have got power imbalances. Power imbalances. Under power imbalances, we are going to discuss limited workers' rights and corporate control. Limited workers' rights. In some systems, workers lack the right to collectively bargain reducing their ability to negotiate fair conditions. You might be working in a company with a friend and uh, maybe you're not earning the same salary and you don't know that you're not earning the same salary. Maybe the other guy is earning much than what you earn. And uh, this is where the problem is. Workers are not treated as equal. The system ensures that that is in place. 
What about corporate control? Employers often hold depropriate powers in deciding wages, conditions, and policies, leaving little room for workers' input. Workers, there is no worker who normally attend uh, board meetings. Board meetings are attended by directors alone, and that's where they discuss. That's the place that they discuss how much they're going to pay people, how much they're going to deduct from people, and how much they want from the workers. So, you see, workers are not given room to come and meet with the owners of the company to negotiate their salaries. So, what am I trying to pass across? I'm trying to say that. What if you are your own boss? You're running your own business. It doesn't matter how small it is. When you are persistent, you have faith in it, you are putting all your energies in it, you are giving it all your time, believe me or not, it's going to bear fruit. So black people need to support themselves and see this gap and grab it. There's a bigger gap here. And this gap is created by the system. And the system ensures that you don't realize that there's a big gap here that you can grab. Number three is the economic inequalities. So under this, we're going to discuss wealth gap. We're going to discuss gender and racial disparities. Wealth gap. Labor system often funnel wealth upward to business owners only. You see that? Labor system only channels uh, money to the business owners. So if you are part of the business community, you are advantaged. And if you are not, you are disadvantaged. Widening the gap between the rich and the working class. You see, there's the rich and that working class. So if you are part of the rich, it means the labor, the labor system is going to favor you. But if you are uh, part of the working class, the labor system is going to work against you. So what do we need to do? We need to be on the rich side. So we need to have our businesses running. It doesn't require much to start a business. You learn from these big people. Learn from people like Elon Musk. Learn from people like, uh, like Bill Gates. Their stories are so inspiring. So if you learn from them, it means you'll not, be, you'll not look for a job again. Instead, people will come and look for a job in your company or in your business. So let's style up. Then gender and racial disparities. Women and marginalized groups frequently face lower wages. Uh, fewer opportunities and workplace discriminations. Then we have got number four, globalizations and exploitations. Outsourcing of low-wage countries. This is very common in my country, Africa. Very, very common. Uh, the companies that are, are here in Africa, they, uh, they don't take education as, as serious as people think. And someone, you know, someone might think that when he has his degree or his master's in a certain area, he thinks like uh, now the company is going to favor him because he's much learned. It's not about the papers. It's about the attitude that you have. It's about how you carry yourself with the people. It's about how you perceive yourself. First of all, is self-respect. You might be learned. You might be so much learned. But if you don't have self-respect, you don't have, uh, you can't be trusted with anything. Nobody will 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 employ you. You might have first-class honors in everything that, that you did in, in in your college, but if you are not able to be trusted, nobody will hire you. Nobody will hire you. So most companies, what what they do, they outsource workers from outside. They give someone contract to get workers who can be paid low as long as they can offer the labor that the company requires, because the company's aim is to make profit, not to make loss. All companies are made to make profit. So the owners, the board members, will figure out all the areas that can enable them make that profit that they want to make, because that is what the system is. Outsourcing of low-wage countries. Some companies often move production to countries with lower labor standards, exploiting workers with poor pay and unsafe conditions. You see, sweet shops and child labor. In some regions, lack of regulations allows for exploitation of children, forcing them into labor, like in Congo, my continent. Like in Congo, you, you saw some videos that was going around 
in the internet some times back where children were found working in the mining areas so that is how the labor system works okay so it's that drastic it's very drastic guys it's very very drastic very very drastic and we need to style up as black people and face this big elephant because the big elephant here is the labor system the labor system is working against us and as black people we have to style up and be ahead of the labor system thank you so much guys and let me know what you think about this video in the comment section until we meet again in my next video show